morning, everyone. Um, I've been asked to conclude this gathering with a colorful presentation concerning our salmon resources. I am a member of the Rural Fish and Wildlife Commission. It's uh, our responsibility to keep the assembly informed of issues pertaining to fish and wildlife in their habitat and to represent the borough in such arenas as the Board of Fish and the Board of Game and the net. We appreciate this op opportunity to come before you to discuss some of the problems that we have with our fishery resources. So let's move into some of those uh, problems. We have an increasing number of residents that are coming becoming dissatisfied with the management of our resources. The reason they're becoming dissatisfied is because of the very frequent closures of so many of our fisheries. And even those that remain open, the fishing is poor. And that results in closures of a lot of the fisheries. And when that happens, you see participation drop. You can see from this slide that we once had over 400,000 days of participation here in the valley. That's dropped to as low as 160 and been hovering around 200,000 for a great number of years. When your participation drops, the economic of the fisheries also deteriorate. We've only had one year where we measured the economic importance of the fisheries in this area. That was back in one, uh, 19, uh, 2007, and you can see it was uh, well over $100 million. I might add that... Uh, Within the next month or two, we are going to get a second assessment of our economic resources. That will be for the year uh, 2016. I expect we will see a great deterioration in the, uh, economic importance. This slide, which shows our stock of concerns, illustrates, I believe, the problems that we have. We have eight of the statewide 18 stock of concern right here in our backyard. What is the stock of concern? It's a label given to fishery resources uh, by the Board of Fish and the Department of Fish and Game because of poor health. And basically, that poor health is uh, identified as failing chronically to make uh, escapement goals and provide harvest. So we have those. We've had the Susitna, the entire Susitna sockeye run has been a stock of concern for over 10 years. That's two life cycles. One of the reasons we have some problems with our fishery resources uh, is related to the way the commercial fisheries is managed in Crooked Island. And I don't want to identify this as the only source of our problems. We have some marine water problems with our king salmon, but this is something we can deal with, the way we manage the fishery. How do we manage the commercial fishery in Crooked Island? How have we done it historically? It's dominated by management to maximize the benefit of Kenai River sockeye salmon. And that's done because that's the most valued resource to the commercial fisheries. And the tools that we have, and uh, I say we, the Department of Fish and Game does the management, are the state of the art for managing Cook Inlet uh, sockeye salmon. We have sonar counters in the mouths of the stream. We have test fisheries. We have genetics and have had these tools for years and years. So, uh, But unfortunately, uh, managing for that one dominant species can have major, major impacts on other species, and those are the species that come to this area. And before I go any further, the area in northern Cookulant, our borough, produces more <coughs> coho salmon, more king salmon, more pink salmon, and more chum salmon than anywhere else in Cookulant. There are, however, more sockeye, the dominant fish for the commercial fishery produced on the Kenai Peninsula. One of the, the questions, I excuse me. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Are you also looking at the, the pike um, and how they are such voracious um, eaters and how they are dominating many of our riverways and, and lakes and, and how that ties in then to the challenges we have here for, for uh, salmon management? Yes. Uh, pike are non-indigenous species, right. not native to this area. Mm -hmm. uh, they've suddenly come here and spread out to a lot of areas and have, have a very negative effect on 
some of our salmon resources. And I'll speak a little bit about it towards the end because we have helped fund ways to uh, help control uh, pike. And that's why when I started this, I said there are multiple problems with our fisheries. This is one that we can correct fairly easy because it's a man-made, man-issued uh, situation. Before leaving this slide, I just wanted to point out one of the difficulties of managing a, uh, the salmon runs of this area and that thing. Look at that. That's a funnel-shaped thing. The fish that come in from the ocean have got to travel all the way up to our area throughout the commercial fishery. There's over 100 and, uh, 1,300 units of fishing gear in the central district alone. So moving forward, you can see the problems in this uh, slide that our salmon resources, the timing are overlapping the month of July and early August. We've got all four species of salmon there that are harvested in the commercial fishery. And the salmon that head for this area, through that fish, we have a roughly 150-mile gauntlet to, to compete with before they get to the, our fishing grounds. What is the solution to this problem? This is a, an issue that uh, our commission has been working on for more than a decade, and we're making some progress in this regard. But basically it requires that we fish more often the commercial fishery, in closer to shore where the stocks of fish are more separated. If you fish in that area that's identified as a conservation corridor, the offshore waters, all these species of salmon that I just showed you on the chart are mixed there. Uh, and fishermen prefer to fish there, commercial fishermen, because they're more concentrated in certain areas out there around tide rips and whatnot, and they're able to catch a lot of fish that are bound for areas such as ours rather than... But by fishing in closer to shore, uh, it would be more like uh, the discrete harvest management of Bristol Bay. If you look at this slide, you can see Bristol Bay does not fish all over the bay. They fish in tight little areas close to shore where they can manage these discrete stocks. Because Igigak, for example, in this area where it's given year, could have a strong run. Naknak may have a weak run. Nushigak may be an in-between run. If you're fishing out there, we're all a mix. How do you adjust your fishing time? So you put them in tight to shore. And that's the concept that we've been talking about here. Fish more often in the green area close to shore and less often out in the blue conservation corridor where they're mixed. And it's working. Uh, when we do this. You can see here by this graph that you catch a lot of coho, and almost all these coho are bound for our areas in, in the month of July and August, uh, than you do when you fish out in, or in the inshore area. Again, Kenai drives the use of this conservation quarter, if you will. The regulations currently say that if the one of Kenai sockeye is predicted to be 2.3 million or less, we get maximum passage of fish bound for this area because we're using the conservation corridor all the time. Uh, 2.3 to 4. Uh, 6 million is a moderate passage, and when it gets over 4.6 million, our fish don't get through because they're fishing almost daily out there in the mixed area. This past year, by the way, we had a 2.3 million, and the corridor was put into effect uh, a lot. We've made all of our escapement goals for the first time since they, these escapement goals have been in effect because of that. Ongoing issues. One of the major issues that's facing our fisheries right now are in the hands of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And many of you probably don't know what that council is, but it's essentially the regulatory body that... Uh, manages our fishery resources in the federal waters off the coast of Alaska. That's beyond three miles. And they were at a lawsuit come before the court, the Ninth Circuit Court, saying that uh, the federal uh, North Pacific Fishery Management Council, which had transferred the authority to manage the federal waters and cooking it to the state, it always has been that way ever since statehood, uh, did this inappropriately. And, the, and this lawsuit came from the commercial fishermen in Cook Inlet. And now the North Council has to write a management plan 
the how they foresee the management of coconut <coughs> salmon in the federal waters of coconut. And this is where they catch one heck of a lot of salmon and coconut. This is basically all the waters south of Calgon Island. The North Council put out a, a request for those interested in working on a stakeholder uh, group to put together to be in compliance with the federal court ruling. Uh, we put in a request to be on that group. The only people that were appointed to this stakeholders were commercial fishermen. So whatever comes out of this court mandated uh, rewrite of the management plan, it could be the federal could be taking over the whole thing like it did before statehood. Or it could be that we'll come up with some reasonable. But the waters that we're talking about is right where all the stocks are missed and all the work that we've done it could be challenged by whatever happens on this uh, court mandate. The other thing I pointed out there was uh, the tight budget. You know, we all know about that in the state, and we're seeing some of our programs lost. Well, the conservation quarter depends on scientific resource. That's how we've been using and convincing the Board of Fish. This is the way we need to start managing our fishery, getting away from the historical ways they did it without <coughs> much in the way of science. We need to have a better understanding of the migration timing and patterns of the various stocks and species that pass through. Cook Inlet. We need to have more and more precise escapement goals. We need to have understanding of exploitation rates and return per spawner type information. We worked with many of you uh, to get funding for a, a genetic study of coho salmon in, in Cook Inlet. <coughs> We've had that kind of information for over 15 years for sockeye. But we just started getting it for coho. We got three years under, four years under our belt, and then it was lost due to budget cuts. An understanding of the productivity of our stocks through genetic sampling is very, very important. I'm just going to give you one example why it's important that we've learned from uh, getting DNA from our fish. If you look at this slide, you can see that Sositna sockeye, which I've already identified as a stock of concern, uh, a pair of sockeye from the Sositna will produce roughly three plus returning adults. <coughs> and you can see that would allow us to harvest one and still have two come back to maintain the resource. The Kenai, on the other hand, is a very, very productive uh, system. Sockeye there, a mom and a papa sockeye there can produce up to eight or nine returning adults. So you can exploit those at something at the level of 75%. Now, the issue is, but knowing this, what if they're all mixed together out there where you're fishing? Are you going to exploit at the level of it's desirable and acceptable for Kenai, which could be 75% of the fish? What would that do to the fish that are coming back to this area, which are only producing one harvestable surplus, raises havoc. And that's the importance of having genetic information to understand the productivity of the runs so we can establish reasonable exploitation rates, and ho hopefully that exploitation will occur where they're not mixed together. One of the tools we were using to better understand uh, the, the migration patterns through the curriculum was this <coughs> North Shore test fishery. Again, this is the commission had worked through our delegation to get funding for this. We got it for five years. Unfortunately, there was a problem in contracting with this, and we only got three years of use out of very valuable three years, but we didn't get the, the last two years that were in the budget. That money got consumed elsewhere within the fishery game budget. That was a very important tool to understanding where our fish are passing through the commercial fishing. Another very important thing that we've had to fight hard to maintain is our escapement goals. I think everybody realized that escapement goals assessment is the cornerstone of management. You can't ensure the health of your fish without having escapement goals and achieving those escapement goals. Uh, each one of these four that we have here in Northern Cook Island have been subject to getting rid of or eliminated because of budget problems. 
we're hopeful that we maintain those during these tough budget times. And finally, or nearly finally, I wanted to point out that we've been very active in uh, habitat protection. We can argue and debate over the fish, but we've got to maintain that habitat. If we lose that, there's no fish to argue over and fight over. Uh, we've been very active in the borough on replacing archaic type culverts that were rolled into creeks with very little information. That benefits fish and also benefits human beings that use those roads or want to use those roads during high water periods. And we have funded uh, a number of uh, uh, pike uh, studies to better understand this invasive species that we talked about earlier. And we've got another one that's not shown here. It's invasive uh, uh, Elodia. Uh, a plant, and we've also invested money in trying, and that's only in one lake so far, we're trying to eliminate it from that one lake before it spreads. And I keep saying we've invested money. Where did that money come from? It came from work that you folks have done, or in your predecessor. We got a, a funding source, $2.5 million here, I think it was in 2014, that the borough was able to use to fund fishery resource things. And that's when I keep saying we help fund some of these things. So, in conclusion, we would like your help wherever possible to ensure that uh, we maintain the, and get maximum use out of this conservation corridor concept. We'd like to see funding restored for the genetic sampling of the commercially caught coho. This is extremely important. We'd like to see that line I spoke about where we got three years instead of five years funding for that restored. And we'd also like to hope that you'll appoint Board of Fish <coughs> members who represent the views of all Alaskans. So that concludes uh, our presentation and we certainly appreciate this opportunity to try to acquaint you with some of the problems uh, as you work uh, through uh, the different issues, uh, general fishery issues come up, please feel free to consult uh, our commission. Thank you.